this is a very scientifically done paper here. But the conclusion was that those who seem to be happy in one direction are unhappy in another. So the whole world is unhappy. Only those are happy who found the truth within. Yes. Uh, my question has to do with destiny. How are they sure that the Catholic philosophers said that we as, as human beings are, are, are moving towards the native form? And I've noticed in, when, I, when I studied biology that with Charles Darwin's theory of evolution that we went from Cro-Magnon to Homo erectus and now we're human beings. Are we moving, is it ever going to change this, this are we moving towards a state of dealing with the Almighty here? <laughs> in a synthetic way for everybody? That's not that's not possible. By the very definition of pain and suffering, that's not possible. If all of us moved into a state of bliss, there'll be no bliss left. How will we relate it? How, in what what will be, what will be the definition of bliss? Today we have a definition of bliss because there is some who are not blissful. If everybody got bliss, we had to redefine it, and everybody will be impoverished. They don't have what they are missing. It is said that in our true home, where we are living like souls without any embodiment, no physical bodies, no sensory astral bodies, no causal mental bodies, but we are living in pure spirit, in light, in the form of light, a pure spirit, consciousness. We are residing by billions in that heavenly home, which is our true home, where we never die. In that state, there are many souls who will be living there forever. Eternity. They are enjoying, they are dancing, singing, having good time, partying all the time. And then some of us who through hard work, finding perfect living masters, hard way of meditation, hard way of doing so many sadhanas and exercises, we ultimately reach up and gasping and tired we reach there. And we also start singing and dancing. And we sing and dance louder than the others. So they ask us, what is so special? We are all in the same heaven. How come you dancing and singing louder than we are? And we tell them, you don't know what you are missing. You never seen what is not what you are singing. You are bored with singing. We know what we are getting. So this duality, this pairs of opposites goes right up to our own home. That we get to know. Let us, let us assume that God never made any creation. He wouldn't be God at all. He is God because he created. He wouldn't be creator. So the very fact that an illusion came into being gave him a different status which was there all the time. He was what he was, but the creation which in illusion gave him a status which wasn't existing. A bliss, a state of permanent happiness or bliss exists. We go into a temporarily created nightmare of unhappiness and awaken to our own bliss and it becomes bliss. If we don't, it doesn't become bliss. So even though the opposite experience may not be real. It may be a temporary dream. It heightens the experience of reality and makes it visible. Yes. Uh, karma, a uh, cause of the misery that exists, is something that people have created in past lives that we have to live out now. That's right. Um, you said that there is no causation. So isn't karma predicated on causation? It is. The question is, isn't karma responsible for our destinies and what we are suffering here, what we are enjoying here? The answer is yes. Karma is the action out of our so-called free will that has led to the effect of our results here. So you notice that karma operates in a time frame. Karma operates with cause and effect. Karma operates where our mind operates. If the mind does not operate, there is no karma. The karma is only confined to mental realms. If you go above the mental realm into spiritual realm, there is no karma. So long as we use our mind to make decisions, we create karma. If you do not use your mind to make decisions, you create no karma. So all the karma that creates our destiny here is being created because we are living with our mind's decisions. The mind's will creates karma. Of course, the mind's will itself is illusion. The truth is beyond the mind. But so long as we are in this level of illusion, the karma, morality, right and wrong, 
decision making, free will and the law of cause and effect, they all go together as one package. The perfect living masters tell us you can rise above this package where there is no karma. While you are here, you are living in karma. How did we pick up karma? Scientists have had some little problem with this notion of time. Has any one of you read the book by Stephen Hawking on the brief history of time? You read it? Anybody else read it? Okay. In, Einstein was the first to be baffled by this question. And the other scientists now are being baffled by this question of time. That cause and effect, karma, can only take place if real time exists. Supposing real time does not exist, there can be no karma. There can be no cause and effect. For karma to operate, there must be a time when you can do something and a time when you can be reacting against what you did. If there is no real time, there can be no real karma. Now the problem is, can such a situation arise where there is no real time? And these scientists found out that if black holes really exist in this universe, of which there is scientific evidence that they do, in black holes, time stops completely. Time as we know it stops. So the clocks, if they enter, supposing an astronaut happens to enter a black hole, as he approaches the black hole, is being sucked in by the black hole, his watch slows down, the last five minutes can be eternity, and then absolutely when he enters the black hole and becomes zero space, zero time, the clock remains stuck cannot move. The time stops altogether. What happens? What happens to the human being? He still is there. Question is, what would be the nature of a human being who is trapped in zero time? It's obviously beyond karma. How can there be karma? There is no time to have karma. Karma needs time. Same thing about space. Karma needs space. Our general notion of space was that space is how far things are from us. You could measure. Space was a measurable entity. So many miles apart, so many light years away. You could measure how far it is. The confusion came when mathematicians came up with something more than the physicists could see. Physics did not let them see what mathematics could let them see. Even in Socrates' time, in the dialogue of Socrates and Plato, they refer to this fact that we cannot see what mathematics can see. Because we can see one hour passing, but we cannot see minus one hour passing. Whereas minus one is a mathematical reality. We cannot experience it. So karma can occur place in plus numbers. If we lead a life in plus numbers where real time is taken for granted, there is law of karma. What happens in zero space? What happens when space contracts to zero and things are all still there? The Buddhists believe that all this creation has taken place from zero, from shunna, from nothingness. Not emptiness, but from nothingness. The nothingness can hold everything without time and space. There is no karma there. In truth, there is a state of being where there would be no karma. It expands from there with some kind of a big bang, creates the time and the sequence and creates karma. Whatever has created this kind of illusion of time has also created the illusion of karma. So our destiny here is created by karma while we are in the sequence of time. Now, in terms of spiritual growth and spiritual realization, the physical state of the physical body in which we converse with each other is totally bound by time. In fact, this situation of a physical body is totally bound by a unidirectional single space time, if I may use a typewriter's lingo, that this is a unidirectional single space. Time ticks at exactly the same way we have designed it to tick in the physical world. In sensory world, if you didn't have the body, you still retained your senses. Have you ever had that experience? Out of body experience. If you can have your sensory experience, say an imaginative experience, supposing you could imagine you are flying and going somewhere, pure imagination takes you somewhere without the physical body. The experience of pure imagination, your personality going with pure imagination or an astral projection of yourself going without this body, in that state, this time sequence is interrupted because you can hold that time wherever you like, then move on. There is a change. 
supposing you are able to transcend this astral form and go into pure mental form, travel with your mind, the concept of your mind make you travel, you can not only go on time and stop it, you can go on time in negative time also, forward and backward, past and future at the same time. These are different degrees of experiences, but the karma can take place in all these three stages. Supposing you go beyond that into pure spiritual self, shed these bodies, shed these covers of the physical body, of the astral or sensory body, or the, or the causal or mental body, shed these and become pure consciousness, you are beyond karma. There is no karma that affects you. Destiny is not created at that stage, except by getting back into a mental state and picking up a capsule or picking up a cassette of a lifetime that has karma built into it than living it here. Yes, the molecules of the body are merely an external reflection of what is happening inside. There is a great relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. All these external things that we can study are directly relatable to what we can see in terms of changes in consciousness. So the molecules of the body are a good subject of study and they respond to whatever consciousness is changing in those molecules. How? Uh, that's a big problem. Uh, when I was working in India, one of the senior politicians there had an accident, a car accident, and got into a coma. He was a very important political person. So we decided to get the best brain surgeons from all over the world to restore him to consciousness. So we got people from all over, including a very big specialist at that time from Canada in Montreal. And he had opened up thousands of brains and done brain surgeries and all kinds of activities. He knew the human brain more than anyone else. So we called him. And he came and he said, this is kind of coma, deep stage of unconsciousness. He described various levels of consciousness and unconsciousness. We were amazed at his knowledge. So ultimately, he asked us, what is it that makes a person consciousness? Conscious. And the brain cells are all active because he's conscious. In some way, some way or the other, when that stops, the whole thing starts decaying. What is that part? And he said, that part. Scientists, doctors, philosophers have been trying to find for thousands of years. We haven't any answer. So the great learned man said, we still haven't found out what that life force is, which gets into a body and makes all these molecules work in a different way. And then that leaves, the molecules do not work in the same way. There must be something in that force, life force, that we have not physically understood. But maybe there is some key to understanding that life force in a way other than studying them through the molecules that respond to that life force. It is obvious that all the molecules of the body respond to that life force. We now have pictures of antibodies, you know that. They show them on the screen. You can see a virus attacking a body and the antibodies appearing from the side of the walls. They were not there, we didn't know where they were. They appear like flames coming out from the solar flares. They appear like that and they attack the virus and catch it. We got pictures of that taken in the body, human body. And they are acting, how do they know it's a virus? We are seeing what kind of labels our viruses are wearing. There are good, there are good germs and bad germs and they recognize them immediately. Do you know such a big universe is going on inside our body? We used to think there's a small world inside us. Now they have found in one cell of the brain, a big history of this universe is going on all the time. And each cell of the brain, there is a new project going on which you might have heard of, the genome project, writing out, mapping out the complete genetic code of the brain cell. In that they found out that one cell contains the entire history of the entire universe and the cosmos. And the entire battles that take place amongst these various cells and viruses and so on is all recorded. This great, wondrous battle is going on, which has uh, sometimes made me feel very strange. That this creation seems to be based upon battles, aggression, <laughs> not upon peace. Apparently, as we have moved away from the subjective spectator of this show into the show, the show has become aggressive, has become dirty, wild, and the, the one who was watching was the only one left in peace. So maybe our self is still peaceful and all around us is not so peaceful. The molecules are great to study, but look at the new New science is coming up which are examining the, the smaller particles, neurons for example. 
molecule looks so big now. At one time, molecule was so small. Now you draw a map and show the neurons moving in. The molecule is a huge universe by itself. It blocks small particles. It's a huge game going on. Whether you start looking at the big galaxies, and we don't know where they end. The more we discover, the more wonderful it looks. For example, the fastest thing that we know of in this world is light. The velocity of light is the highest. Nothing, nothing travels in our known universe at a speed greater than the speed of light. We don't know of anything else. And surprisingly, the speed of light is fixed. It does not observe the laws of the Doppler effect, which means other things when they move, if they are going away from us and we are going running, we, our movement and their movement adds to the speed and changes the pitch of their movement. If a train is coming into a station and it's whistling, if it's coming in, it whistles differently. If it's going away, it whistles differently. We can see the difference in the sound. Because the Doppler effect, the stretching of the speed by its going away, makes the whistle sound differently. It's coming in, condenses the wave motion and sounds differently. Only in the case of light, as a wave motion, it makes no difference as it's going or coming. It's got a fixed velocity, which has amazed scientists still today. They cannot explain why it is so. But the more surprising thing is, if better telescopes have given us an edge in the quasars to those galaxies way beyond billions of light years, which are moving according to our calculations at velocities greater than the velocity of light. We have no explanation. How can anything move? Nothing moves here at greater than the velocity of light. How are those bodies moving there? So we are coming up with new theories, all speculation that maybe there is a world of matter and antimatter coexisting. Maybe they are not so far away. Maybe they are here. But they look far away because they are made of something other than our molecular structure. Our molecules are made of atoms in which the positive must be at the core. The negative must go around it. We cannot have any matter in this world where the core is not made of positrons or a positive core and electrons, negatively charged electrons going around it. That's the planetary system of all molecules. But the antimatter has the reverse. The core is negative charged and the electrons are going with the positive charge around them. So the new assumption, which is almost taken for granted by scientists now is that matter is created from black holes or nothingness or dense matter with no volume, no time and space when that cracks up breaks, it breaks simultaneously into matter and antimatter. And the fact that there are two different sets of movements, negative and positive going on, they cause molecules to be formed of different kinds. When they collapse together, each time they reach out to each other, they dissolve, leading to nothingness. From the same nothingness, they can split and again become matter and antimatter. So matter and antimatter are ho holding this whole creation in pairs of opposites. This is scientific treat is not, it's not from a spiritual literature. They are talking of this thing in the scientific treaties now. So the molecule that we used to talk of uh, in high school turned color. They are looking at such big things and we have a lot more evidence now that there is a state of being where the molecules can exist without any movement. We have no, def we had no definition at all. In a black hole, they all exist without movement. New theory. Beyond Einstein. But the matter is traveling more than speed of light, then it becomes immaterial. It is anti-matter. Anti-matter. They are calling it anti-matter. If it is traveling beyond speed of light, they are calling it anti-matter. Yes. Not immaterial. They still call it matter, but it still exists in almost the same form. So where do we end this? The question is, this is all related to our notion of time. If time can be held, all these theories change, speculation will change. I dare say that scientists themselves will come up and tell us that time was a creation of our mind and that time has been created and therefore karma and everything will become a scientific subject at that time. That we created time and we created karma. When we stopped time, karma stopped also. Our destiny in time stopped. Do we have a destiny outside of time? The mind cannot answer that question because mind cannot operate outside of time. 
we are relying so heavily on a little machine in our head that cannot even operate outside of time and space, such a limited thing and we identify with it and we are so proud of it. How can we make spiritual progress? This is the company we keep. There is a little story, there is a little story in India of a, of a princess, a, a king's daughter and the king was very happy, my daughter has grown up, I will marry her to another prince and she will have a happy life in some large palace of a neighboring kingdom. But the daughter fell in law, uh, fell in love with a poor man, uh, we call it a scavenger in India, that is a low caste, Harijan, you know we have got four caste system. So in India the daughter fell in love with the lowest caste man and very poor, had no palace, nothing, he did not even have a proper hut to live in. So poor daughter from the princess from the palace going to live with that man, naturally the father was very disturbed and unhappy. But he was saying, okay, if my daughter finds true love from this man, at least he will get something. When the daughter goes to that man, the man has no love for the woman. The man loves various women of the street. He goes to prostitutes, not one, one, two, three, four, five of them. This is the miserable story of the princess. This is our story, our soul, daughter of the Lord, separated to have another worldly, uh, 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 heavenly experience, falls in love with the mind of low caste and the mind is not loving the soul anymore. The mind loves these five senses, which are like prostitutes. Those senses drag the mind outside to this world. What is happening to our consciousness, to our soul? Story of the same princess. It's our story. We are keeping bad company. <laughs> we are keeping bad company because we think that the mind alone is good company to make decisions. That's not true. We should rely more upon our spirit, upon the spiritual soul, which has all the capabilities of making right decisions. Any other comment or question? Yes. We're going through a spiritual transformation. You said. Yes. How does this affect the physical universe? We seem to be going through a great scientific transformation at the same time. That's true. Because the science and spirituality, like I referred to earlier, have never been closer than today. How is this going? How is this spiritual transformation going to affect the world we live in? In it, relation to greed. In relation to these things that seem to be destroying our society from within us. The spiritual transformation should make people less greedy, less lustful, less possessive, less, less egoistic. If they do that, it will be a new society. The spiritual transformation has always done that to people and then the people as a society, as a group have been happier than before. So when the spiritual revolution takes effect and changes, transform the people, they will be much better people. If the people are still greedy, people are still lustful, people are still possessive, egoistic, haughty, they haven't made any spiritual progress. This is taking place in the world. It is. I, I immigrated. I moved from one country to another <laughs> just to see it. I have taken the ringside seat just for that reason, which you have mentioned. I want to see it happen. As it is, I am seeing it happening. It's happening right here. It will transform people, then only it will transform the world. If people are not transformed, there is no transformation in the world. Yes. Are there mind, body, and soul equal parts more than unequal? Unequal. The soul is real and permanent and creates the experiences of the mind. The mind is more permanent than the body and the senses, but less permanent than the soul. The mind has a longer duration. The mind then with the soul provides the motive power for senses to develop. The sensory world or the astral world has a longer, uh, longer life than the physical body, but not as long as the mind. The physical body is released and dies quickly. The rest are still intact when this dies. Yes. What, uh, how does the, uh our experiences are bound by time. How do our experiences look when there is no time? In other words, how do the experiences of our life look in the absence of time? The things, everything that happens in our lives occurs on a time continuum. 
uh, if you look at it outside of time, how is it possible to... Uh, I've always wondered what the experiences of our life seem to be in the absence of time. Uh, look at the painting. In one glance, you said yes. Yeah. You didn't take any time. Well, but now, now look at it with time. From one corner, move corner to corner, inch by inch, yeah. and see it. Does it look different? Yeah. Then what you saw total? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. When you are looking at world without time, you see the totality of it. It's beautiful. How do you know when, when one experience ends and one? I mean. If you were looking at that in terms of your life, there would be a... There would be I just gave an example. I gave an example. Now, just like I said, one inch of it. You see, inch by inch, you won't see the beauty of what you can see in the total picture. Yeah. Similarly, in life, when we see it through time, we see it minute by minute, hour by hour, yeah. day by day. Yeah. And that's what makes it look ugly. If you could, in timelessness, see the whole of life together in one glance, it look beautiful. Just a hypothetical way of saying it because the mind cannot comprehend the state where you see without time. But still to give you an example, that what happens in timelessness is you see the whole of it at once. Without without having to go sequentially over time or over space. But you can uh, conceive of a situation where the whole world, whole life can be seen at once. Can you conceive of it? Yes. If you saw it, what would it be like? It would be different from what you are seeing now. Can you also see parts of it? Yes, you can see parts of it. Where are the boundaries? Of it? Where does one event end and the, end, and the next one begin? We make it ourselves. We set our own boundaries. I'll tell you a little story about the boundaries. In terms of time and space, we are told that we are like drops of the ocean and our creator is the ocean. And sometimes the spiritual path has been described as the drop of the ocean going and merging in the ocean. Have you heard that? That we are like little drops separated from the, from our true home, our true Lord, who is in the heavens, and we have to search back and merge in that big ocean. This has always bothered me from childhood. I said, as a drop, I have some personality, some identity. I am recognized even by myself. If I merge in the ocean, I go, I go, I finished. What do I get? I lose everything I have by merging in an ocean. As a drop, I have got everything. What does the ocean gain? Ocean doesn't gain at all by one drop adding to it. So by merging in the ocean, I lose everything. The ocean gains nothing. Who is the wiser? What are they teaching us? What is the spiritual path they are teaching us? That the soul, individual consciousness should merge with the total and it will just be great bliss. The ocean is already having its bliss. I am having my misery. But in my misery, I have an identity. I go and merge in that. I, it's just like committing suicide. It's a spiritual suicide. But I was mistaken. I was mistaken because I thought that the drop had left the ocean. The truth was the drop never left the ocean. The drop drew a boundary and became an ocean. What is the ocean except drops of water? They're all put together. When a drop draws a boundary and says, I am only this much, it becomes a drop. Where is the boundary? It sets its own boundary. It can become a big drop or a small drop by setting its own boundary within the same ocean without leaving it. That was our state. Our merging does not mean we go somewhere and merge. Merging meant expansion of consciousness to totality. That made sense then. The spiritual path has a sense. So when you talk of our ability to look at totality and also the parts, where do we set the boundary? Where is the boundary? We set it. Consciousness sets the boundary. So you can set the boundary to look at small parts like this or the whole of it. Or completely small little slices of life and go through that. We set our own boundaries. When do we set our boundaries? Not now. We are, already, we are experiencing the setting up of boundaries. We set the boundaries when we are purely in a mental state with no physical body and no senses. We set the boundaries at that time. And that's another way of creating destiny. We create the setting for a destiny by first setting the boundaries of our experience, of our perception. If the boundaries of perception are slice by slice, the law of karma comes in full strength, takes effect. Because we have allowed all those segments to create cause and effect. When we set our boundaries in large segments, 
the law of karma operates in a very diluted way. But it can only use one segment as one stop on the cause and effect charge. So, we do not get affected so much by the law of karma. When we set our, our boundaries at boundless large millions of years as one moment, the law of karma does not touch us at all. We set our boundaries at the mental state. So, we are the makers of our destiny in every way. Any other last question or comment? Yes. Humbleness. Yes. Humbleness is a great state because uh, our problems in life have arisen because of our ego. Humbleness takes away the biggest problem. I want to tell you that why it's so important. This ego or lack of humility, humility, lack of humbleness, lack of humility, which makes us, I can do it, I want to do it, I know about it, I, 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 that we are saying all the time. It is this I that separates us from the rest of experience and sets the boundaries closer into a thin slice. The more ego we use, the closer the boundary we set and therefore greater the impact of karma upon us. The more I we use, the more the effect of karma upon us. The less I we use, the more we we use, the more totality we use, the less karma we face. So the I, the ego sets the boundaries for that. So humbleness is to remove that boundary. Okay, thank you very much. I was very happy to meet all of you again. See some of you tomorrow.